Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. You can't go very far in your revival research without running into this guy, Robert Schlerden, God's Generals. Listen, if you want a in full encompassing overview of revivals and through history, look into that, look into his books, God's Generals. But I got a treat for you today because with me on the set is Robert Schlerden. Roberts. Good to be thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, as we're reaching across this, <laughs> what is this you've brought with you? Well, that's a statue that I did of Smith Wigglesworth that I did years ago to raise money for our mission department. And so I had a few extra ones left. So uh, I thought I'd bring you and the, the set to have a little statue oh, of Smith wonderful. at Wigglesworth. Thank you. Thank you that's very That's the way much. he was toward the end of his life. He was probably in his 70s during that time period. So that's his normal stand. That's his New Thank Testament. You. Thank you very he would much. Carry. Yeah. So that's who he is. I've got all, I mean, I've got a lot of Robert's stuff here. So I can say he's got, there's a plethora of literature here for you to look at and read. So take a look at it. But I want to talk to you today without getting into too much detail in the beginning. I want to talk about just a revival in the history from all your research that you've done, because we are of like breed here. Okay. <laughs> what is it that you see is the common denominator to where God moved in one of these great revivals. What's the common denominator? Well, the, well, there would be several. The first one is God uses the unlikely candidate to be the leader or the spark of it. Uh, everybody I've studied should not have been who they became. There were reasons for their misconduct in their personal life or the right, not the right education or they didn't have the right spiritual heritage. And for some reason, God and them connected at a right moment and they were used to spark uh, that particular thrust of God or the importance of God at that moment. So, like who? who uh, give us well, the guy right here, Smith Wigglesworth, be one. I mean, Wigglesworth, he couldn't even talk. Right. I mean, if you just want to talk about Smith, he couldn't talk. His first part of his ministry was Salvation Army children's pastor, taking the horse down the street and all the little kids to get a ride to church and a ride home. That's how Smith started. Most of us don't realize that the Smith Wigglesworth we know began after his wife's death when he was 50 some years old. And so when we talk Smith Wigglesworth, it's after 50. So everybody watching that thinks I'm 50 and over, well, Smith became the great Wigglesworth at age 50 after his wife died. So those are some of the basic ones. Um, General Booth, the Salvation Army, another right. gentleman that had just got to say it for worse terms, kicked out of the Methodist church because he was getting too many people saved and was disturbing that district area's church's stability. And he had to quit bringing the lost into the church and he got kicked out because he wouldn't do it. And he ran down the street and bumped into the tent meeting that began the Salvation Army. So these are the most unlikely people, right. usually at a place where the low point, Miss Kuhlman, at the worst moment of her life is when God gave her the great healing mantle. What was so, the worst moment of her life? Well, she just, uh, she had a great <clears throat> ministry and she married the wrong man and it was ending in divorce and she walked to a dead end street in California and she said to Jesus, I have nothing. All I have left is that I have my love for you. If you can use that, use that please. And that was the moment God goes, yeah, I have an anointing. I've been trying to get in the earth and I've asked three guys and they've said, no, would you do it? And she said, yes. And that became the beginning of Catherine Kuhlman. I want his smile. I want his favor. I want him to fold me close to his heart. I want him to look now. And when his service is all over with, and the crowd is leaving and I go back to an empty dressing room, and I take off the long white dress and I take my feet out of the shoes. I think of just one thing. Did I please him? 
Did I do my best for him? Have you seen that anywhere else where someone felt like they were not or got a, a word from God that they weren't the first choice? There are those that have uh, made comment like that in different, uh, especially <clears> the <throat> of Hebrew revivals and some Pentecostal mm -hmm. leaders. They felt like they weren't God's first, second, or third choice. I think Catherine was so uh, large because she would tell it. I was not, if you know how she talked, yes. I wasn't God's first choice. I wasn't mm -hmm. even his third choice. <laughs> I was his fourth choice. And so, you know, I'd like to interview the three men that said no to that mantle. Right. You know, he's yeah. like, are you nuts? Yeah, are you Look crazy? what she got and that God was trying to get in there. So you have that as a common denominator, the most unlikely people coming out of some of the most worst moments or sad moments of their life. And they reach and God reaches and this divine thing happens and it sparks a great move. All right, well, let me do this. I'm going to go through some names Okay. And I want you to give me your snapshot of each one of these guys. Okay. I hope I know them all. And they're not in necessarily a certain order or chronological order. Okay. Okay. Jack Coe. Um, a very wonderful man that began um, uh, out of hurt and rejection. God anointed him, but died at the height of his career because of mismanagement of personal life. He did not manage his health. And thus he died of a 90 year old body. When they did the autopsy on him, he had a body of a 90 year old man. He was overweight and he did the big tent thing, had the great gift of faith, but did not know how to deal with his own personal challenges, which led to an early departure. Hagen and, and, and Roberts, or Roberts and both said he had the greatest gift of faith of anybody they knew. But regardless, 38 is way too young. To he leave. just got going. Think yeah. if he was, if he got to be 70 and then went to heaven, what he could have done. Right. And uh, so. Good. Okay, next one. Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, uneducated, uh, never finished into a formal education, had his first experience with the Holy Spirit in a grandmother's Methodist, Shouting Methodist revival meeting. Uh, got enthused with the Holy Spirit because people were getting healed in the Alexander Bodies meetings in Sutherland. And uh, he didn't like the tongues stuff, mm -hmm. but he stayed around long enough to fall into it, we could say. And when he got spirit filled, his stuttering left. And uh, so he began to minister, like I said a moment ago, his ministry really did not begin until after his wife died. Uh, when Polly died on the doorsteps of the church, uh, he of course went ahead and, and, and buried his wife and was grieving. And across in his home at 70 Victor Road was a stack, about four, five inch stack of envelopes. And these were invitations for Smith to come and preach because before he didn't travel around the world as much because he had a church and a wife and family. Right. And so he stayed around Europe and mainly England. And so he dried up his tears and picked up his grieving heart and said, I'm going to go. And he began to answer those invitations, which led him into the worldwide ministry of bringing the Holy Spirit to South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. The man that initially brought that movement there. And he had a great personality, had a Yorkshire type of uh, uh, rogue, accent, yeah. rogue is the yeah. word. And um, they asked him one day, because he's known for his abruptness. Right. Now he didn't do that all the time, but he did it enough to where it's legendary. And they asked him one time, why do you hit people? He goes, I don't hit people, I hit the devil, they just get in the way. And so his personality was such that it worked yeah. on that. Uh, Brother Summerall, my spiritual father, said in the years he went to visit Smith at his home, he never met anybody else going to the house to meet Smith. Old great men usually died lonely because no one seeks out their wisdom. And so hopefully people watching will find the living generals today of a Wigglesworth stature mm -hmm. and go and say, what can we learn? Tell me that story again. Will you pray for me? I've been to people today <clears> that <throat> they're home alone and they did great things for God and they should not be alone. Great men and women should be surrounded by young men right. and the future Amen generals. Amen to that. So. That is so true. All right, you touched on my next one. My next one is Lester Sumrall. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That thing that just runs all over the whole total human spectrum, uh, hurting you in every place. Then he says, but God has given us three things. You ought to underline them there. This is 2 Timothy 1 and 7. And I'd like to supplement a few words if you don't mind. But God has given us a spirit of power. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. Now, the word power has to do with authority. It has to do with two things, energy and authority. Uh, it's first, authority. God has given us a spirit of authority. That's the reason we speak so positively, because we know. You see, we know. 
God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of authority that you know. You speak it, and it has to be done. I will be telling you about a, a witch doctor in the <clears throat> morning service that I interviewed this last week, one of the most prominent witch doctors in the whole of Africa. And uh, when we got through with the interview for an hour and a half, I said, do you feel anything remarkable or unusual about me? I hadn't told him who I was yet. I just asked questions. That witch doctor said, well, Reverend, he didn't know naturally that I was a reverend. He says, behind you is a light that I have to observe and says, you are a very strong man. He said, I would never cross you. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power that's even recognized by people that worship the devil. He said, I wouldn't ever want to cross you. And, and so God has given us a spirit of authority in the world that we live in today. Don't you wish we used it? Lester Summerall carried uh, a degree of Smith's uh, mantle or anointing. The last time Summerall went to see Brother uh, Smith, the, the war was on, World War II was on, and he had to get out of England. The British had sent him a letter to go home. So he went to his house to say goodbye. And in the four-year area of Smith's home, uh, he told him immediately, get on your knees. And Smith laid his hands on his shoulders and began to pray. And Brother Summerall said he cried until the, the tears off of Smith's cheek would hit Summerall's forehead and ask God to give him a portion of what he carried. And that's the day that Brother Summerall lost fear. Mm. He was the boldest and most fearless man that I ever met. So he was fearful before that. Well, to some degree, yes, yeah. but he made the comment after that to me that he never had a fear that he ever dealt with. Again, it's one of those things that just kind of happened. And he was, a, he was a bold guy. He was gruff. I use the yeah. word gruff. Gruff is a good word. Um, not mean or rough, but gruff. That's right. a, between, gruff. You had to know him. He had to understand. Part of that was he's Irish. He's an apostle. Uh, he's also uh, got a certain degree of punch to him. All that wound up together created the gruffness of Brother Summer. Now, what he is known for besides, he only knew Smith for three years, three to four years. The man that no one ever talks about is Howard Carter. It was his spiritual father, right. which is an unsung hero of the Pentecostal movement. But uh, to go back to, to Summerall, what was great with Summerall's ministry was the Filipino revival. Uh, the Philippines never had a Protestant revival until the great deliverance of Carlita with Brother Summerall in the 1950s. And um, I don't know if we have time to even go into that, but the great revival there came because he cast the devil out of God that was being bitten by an evil spirit. Mm -hmm. And the mayor gave him anything he wanted out of appreciation, and he asked for the city square that seated or stood about 150,000 people. And so after six weeks of revival, after that right. deliverance, there was over 150,000 conversions in six weeks, and Protestantism exploded in the Philippines. And he built at that time the largest Protestant church in all of Asia. After Summerall's great church became Cho, was the next great church in Korea. Right. So the first great huge church in Asia was Summerall's in the tens of thousands. And so he had that. And so at the height of that, and you know, they're still talking. There's still, when you go to the Philippines, you can still see evidence. People have well, pictures of that in their home. Yeah, that, it, it, that, it was the demoniac. event yeah. that allowed all Protestant churches to thrive. Right. He dealt with the principality and power. He dealt with the national <clears throat> power there with that deliverance. Somehow that power and that deliverance and that thing with that girl knocked that thing back to yeah. where it's still not back. And uh, so it was a very interesting thing. And at the height of it, at the height of that church, height of that revival, God told him to come back to America. And so it seems like every place some wrong gets to going, it gets rolling. And then at the height of it, God sends him someplace else. And uh, he came back home and he actually did more to help young ministers than anybody else I know right. for the end of his life. And I was glad to say that he was my spiritual dad and I had good relationship. He told me I was right. He told me when I was wrong. And it was good to have that in your life. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of wisdom in yeah. that. Okay, next up, A.A. <clears throat> a. Allen. Look at this child. Six years old. Can't walk. How many would like to see this poor little kitty heal tonight? Look at that. Oh, my God. Did you ever see anything like it in your life? 
Yes, honey. Poor little thing. <laughs> I'm praying for this baby tonight. God will lift the curse and let this baby begin to grow and become normal. Hold him, honey. Hold God. Oh, God. Yes, sir. In the name of Jesus, make him normal. Make him whole. Let him walk. Let him talk. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask for the glory of God. Make him normal in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus. Oh, these legs hold him up tonight. <laughs> Let these legs hold him up tonight, Jesus. Oh, God. Yes, Lord. See, man. See, man. See, man. Everybody, see, man. I'd like for you out there in your homes to sing with me. Everybody sing it. Sing it, everyone. In the with me. Do you love Jesus tonight? Sing it one more time. Let's dedicate it to all that have been saved while they watch this telecast. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And I'd like to know that every one of you in your home there today are singing with me. Will you do it? And one of these days when you get up yonder, the pearly gates open wide. You're going to see us coming down the Golden Street. <laughs> greatest miracle ministries and the last of the great voice of healing revivals. Um, a man that was raised by moonshine parents who would put liquor in his bottle uh, when he was a baby to make him quiet and got saved by a track uh, or got provoked by a track that led him to a church of a lady preacher that got him saved and turned him around. And he went to see Or Roberts here in Dallas uh, because he was passionate at Corporate right. Christie, Texas. 
because the church wanted their pastor to kind of get revived. Well, <laughs> it revived him so much he left the church and began the great A. Allen Revival Ministries. And he had some phenomenal miracles. I mean, he was one of the most persecuted. That is a true statement because of the miracles. Uh, also because he integrated his tent. He also was prophetic. He began to tap into the prophetic thing that we know about today, prophetic music, uh, things like we, we call it prophetic music, but music that can move in the spirit. Right. Very, I'll say it that way. Because <clears throat> he goes down as one of the greats and, um, and no way you divide up the pie. He is one of the most wonderful guys. Amen to that. Okay. <clears throat> R.W. Shambach. Are you listening to me, folks? There's trouble in the land, but there is still hope for the people of God. Let them worship their false gods. I'm not bowing down to any false god. God is God. And he's the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. And he is the answer to every one of our problems. You don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. Uh, the true successor, Brother Allen's <coughs> ministry anointing. Stuart was, got the machines and the paper. Uh, Shambach got the mantle, in my opinion. Uh, he was able to pick that up and continue it and be able to come into another generation, which would be mine, your generation. Yeah. And he was one of the received authentic tent preachers of our time, which were very few in those days. Right. The era was over. Seems like God always leaves one or two that is successful and highly on that keeps that little thing alive for some reason. And he was that, and he, you know, you don't have any problem with Jesus, more faith in God, his radio show and great, great man. He came to my church a couple of times and preached and um, he never spoke negative about Brother Allen, which I always respect. He always would say, I never knew him like that. And maybe he never did. And I, I guess it was a different time period because I'd ask him about all the, the miracles and the controversy we just mentioned. But he always, if you're going to carry a mantle from somebody, you must not become a, be negative against the thing that you're mm. carrying. You've got to be able to hold it correctly or it begins to diminish and sometimes fades. That is, what you just said is a mouthful. Well, you've got to be able to carry it. Yeah. Wow. Part of it is to understand the both the good and the bad. Every mantle has its great things. Like if you carry a Catherine Kuhlman mantle, which began, which came down from Mother Edder. It came from Edder to McPherson to Kuhlman and then to Benny Hinn carries some degree. All of them had the same type of miracle power, the same type of draw, and they all had the same problems. They had divorce problems, and at the end they had heart and health problems, every single one of them. So there is a certain spirit that Lucifer assigns to buffet mantles, certain kinds of mantles. So if you carry something from someone, you better know the good and the bad of it so you can outsmart the bad and know how yeah. to punch it and go around that and not fall into it. Every single one of them, if we had time, we could go through all of them, and I can show you exactly how great it was, and they all had the same problems. Right. So. What about, all right, let's, let me think of where to go to next, because I got like eight different directions here. All right, well, let's just say Oral Roberts. Uh, another stutterer <clears throat> that didn't want to be a preacher, he wanted to be the governor of Oklahoma was his desire in life. He did not want to be a poor little Pentecostal. He ran away from home and collapsed on the basketball court during the basketball tournament, coughing up uh, parts of his lungs. He had tuberculosis, which in those days meant you were going to die. Yeah. And God healed him in a tent meeting about the size of the studio. He was the last one to be prayed for. And God brought Oral Roberts on the scene to bring the Pentecostal church from the wrong side of the tracks to the right side of the tracks. He finally was able to bring education and anointing together. Uh, and go back. What do, you, what do you mean when you say the wrong side of the tracks to the right side? Well, of the early track? Pentecostals were looked upon as uh, uneducated, uh, rude, um, loud, not orthodox, mm. all the things. Well, you go from classical Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, hymn singing, preaching, the classical way, and all of a sudden, for the first time in a thousand years, you're allowing emotion to be a part of your worship service. So if you felt a song, you could get happy and say amen, or you could clap your hands, and then the anointing came on your head, you could mm, and run down the aisle. Now yeah. that did not, and all of a sudden that began to be allowed. That's why early Pentecostals would say, uh, you know, uh, you can feel it, but just don't be led by it. It's all right to feel it. So when Pentecost came along, they were preaching, God, I heal you today. Bible days are here again. That a faith like the apostles have returned, and you can get the, your miracle and the 
gifts and the fruits and the graces are here. And they, and they begin to get it. And so these are the educated people looking down on these folks who are shouting, but they're getting out of their wheelchairs and their churches are growing. Or Roberts comes along and begins with class and dignity and education and then begins to tap into the cultural things of the day because usually most people that have a revival are anti-culture. If you're smart, you'll learn how to mix culture and revival together so you can go straight into it. In those days, the television called the TV yes. from the Pentecostal, yes. you know, the American government asked the denominations to send responsible people to help govern this new medium of television when it first began. And 90% of them did not even want nothing to do they with it. They refused. And so we inherited the mess of that generation. But Oral Roberts decided he wanted to be on the little black box of TV and he couldn't find anybody in the Christian full gospel circles who understood television. He had to go to Hollywood and ask three guys. And this is where the term Hollywood preacher came from. It was a mm -hmm. slap against Oral. Right. And so, but he had nobody. He didn't have TV cameras like you got in the guys yeah. back here. That didn't exist. He right. had to go find somebody. And then all of a sudden, it began to work. And he found the camera guys and the people that could do it. And he began to go on TV. And there was a young man named Lonnie Rex that lives in Houston who uh, got him supernaturally bumped into the FCC kind of guy of the time that got Oral Roberts connected to go on hundreds of stations in a matter of a short amount of time because they weren't going to put Oral on. Right. And he turned it and they were at, well, they met at a Rolls Royce car show. Wow. Because Ronnie Rex and that guy both lo loved Rolls Royce cars. And they were the last two to walk out of that show in Tulsa that day. Wow. And that's how it happened. When I started this journey of learning about revivals, it took a lot of time. I had to look at books, I had to look at videos, I had to scour the internet. Listen, here the Revival Radio TV team has taken all of that effort out. All you've got to do is go to our website, RevivalRadioTV.com. Here you can contact us, you can watch episodes, you can sign up to be on our email list, and you'll get an email every week about what's happening and special videos. But I want to show you a special feature that's on the website, and that's the timeline. Now, on this timeline, you can see it in you can see it in 3D, where it looks like that, or you can see it in 2D, and you can actually actually scroll through history of revival. Is that cool? You can go through here and you can see what God did. So let's go here, for instance, uh, <clears throat> right here in. Uh, uh, let me see a good one. I want to stop. Okay, 1926, Vern Ives Pentecostal Christians of Evangelical Faith First Conference. I can find out more information about what happened in Russia. The Pentecostal leaders gathered in Odessa, Ukraine for an assembly. You know, it is amazing when you start into this, you see how God wove from one revival to the next, how he plucked people out from one part of the world and put them in somewhere else. This is a feature you want to take advantage of. So go to the website, would you? RevivalRadioTV.com. Look on that. Sign up for all the updates that we get and take advantage of this timeline. You won't regret it. Until next time, remember, be the one. <laughs>